Appreciate it. Uh, our next speaker here um, is Matthew Shapiro. He's a livestock advisor in Santa Barbara, Ventura counties. And again, he's been thinking about drying climate, drought, and ranching for a long time. He's going to share some of his um, ideas and thoughts with us. Go ahead, Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you all for having me here this morning. It's a real honor to be uh, speaking in front of the group here up at SF Rec. Uh, Andy's presentation is actually a, a perfect uh, segue into what I'll be talking about, and I think you guys will understand in a few minutes why. But I'm talking about weather forecasting, and I've added this concept of weather prediction or likelihood prediction, and how those things might work into on-ranch decision-making. So I think most of us have seen a graph that looks something like this. This is precipitation data from SF Rec uh, from 1895 up until 2018. So about 124 years worth of precipitation data. Uh, you can see we're located here, about 33 and a third inches on average over those 124 years. But of course, the thing that's most characteristic of California is the variability, right? So hardly a year that's average, and lots of years that are far from average. And then, of course, we can sort of, I'm, I'm highlighting here some of our sort of the more famous droughts, so the one that we just got through, uh, 2013, or 2012, 2013 to 17, uh, the drought in the late 80s, early 90s, the, drought, the famous drought, 76, 77, and then some droughts that probably fewer of, us, fewer of us remember, the drought in the 50s and droughts in the 30s. This is a slide that's very similar to the, the, the slide that Jeremy put up, and it's sort of, uh, I think, helpfully busy. Um, <laughs> but it's showing, this is SF Rec clipping data. I borrowed this slide from Larry Ferrero's presentation a couple years ago, and this is something that Dustin Flavelle here at the, uh, at the field station has put together, but it's showing forage production across the years that they've been, that they've been uh, tabulating it. And of course, here is peak standing production at the end of the year. And the precipitation, and I, I want to emphasize and the first to, to acknowledge that precipitation, total precipitation and peak standing forage are not tightly coupled, of course, in California. Jeremy's presentation this morning sort of emphasized the importance of timing of the precipitation and temperature during the season. But of course there is a strong relationship between the two. And so the variability in precipitation in California leads to the variability that we see in peak standing crop. And you can see sort of that distinctive growth curve through the months of the year on any given year. This is also a Larry Ferrero slide, but I think is one that helpfully illustrates the sort of decoupling of forage production and precipitation. So, you know, for example, this is, uh, data that's been collected outside of Reading. And so for a year like in the early 80s, the highest uh, forage production that Larry's clipped in that time happens to be on a year with sort of average precipitation. And then sort of dating back to the late 70s, despite you know the 76, 77 rainfall years being extremely low, you're seeing one year actually had sort of average forage production. So just, again, emphasizing that decoupling. But also, of course, there is uh, precipitation strongly drives, uh, to a certain extent, forage production. This is actually a table that uh, Dan Macon put together a couple years ago in a drought publication, but I think it's really useful and it sort of helps me transition into what does all this sort of weather and drought talk mean on a ranch, right? And uh, he's helpfully separated into proactive and reactive drought strategies. And I've used this in, in drought presentations and I've poured over it. And one of the things that surprised me is this figure here. So what it is, it's a survey of California cattle ranchers uh, in 2011, I think, and they're asked sort of what strategies do they use? And I was surprised to see that this idea of using weather predictions to adjust stocking was not used that much, 11%. And for the amount of time that ranchers spend talking about the weather, I was surprised that so few actually use it to inform decisions on the ranch. So I've, since sort of uh, working with that table, done a little bit of thinking about how ranchers might use weather forecasting and weather prediction in on-ranch decisions. And for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on sort of two different pathways that a rancher might think about using weather forecasting and prediction. The first is this idea of seasonal climate predictions the sort of more traditional way that we think about forecasts. And the second is what I think is the more exciting opportunity, is this idea of likelihood predictions 
based on historical weather data. So to begin, this idea of seasonal climate prediction, um, Andy sort of touched on this, but it's, it's, it sits somewhere in between sort of shorter term forecasts and the sort of two week, uh, two week length period and longer term climate predictions that are on the scale of like one to a hundred years. And so this, many of you are probably familiar with, this is a product that NOAA comes out with, it's their three month outlook. And this particular example uh, came out in the middle of November of 2015, and they are forecasting a three month period, which is December, January, and February of 2015. If you remember, there was really strong indication of El Nino that summer leading up to this fall. There was a lot of hope and thought that there would be above average uh, rainfall, which this three month uh, graph is indicating. I wanted to spend some time breaking, breaking this down because although it is sort of simple in appearance, there is a lot happening there. I won't take the time, but suffice it to say that the, you know, it functions in this sort of tercile manner where there is, you know, uh, well, there's average or equal chances, which is the white. Uh, the brown color is uh, below average chances and the green is above average chances. Um, and again, I just want to emphasize that we're not asking a whole lot of NOAA here, right? This is two weeks out. There, we're asking them to tell us what three months are going to look like. Um, this, the trouble with this is that they're frequently inaccurate, and it's hard for ranchers to really base decisions. And this, this is working at a scale that ranchers might be making decisions on. And the reality is that we don't know really how accurate this is. This particular image is, is a good indication of how inaccurate they can be. It turns out that this was yet another pretty severe drought year and, and sequence of three months of drought. And um, so it would be nice to know how accurate it is. And in fact, NOAA does its own analysis of itself in terms of its own accuracy. And uh, this is a table that NOAA produce, produces on its own and it's showing the accuracy of those three month outlooks from the period of 1995 to 2015. And it turns out that they're really not accurate at all, definitively not accurate. So basically, everywhere where there's white, you would have as much luck predicting the weather two weeks out for that three month period if you just threw a dart at a dartboard. In the Pacific Northwest and in the Southwest, where the El Nino patterns affect long term weather, or sort of seasonal weather patterns more strongly, they have some success. So those are the numbers above 100. And in Oklahoma, Texas, you'd actually be better off throwing a dart at the dartboard than you would be listening to Noah's weather prediction. And so the team that uh, Andy alluded to, uh, the equation team out in Arizona, has done some work uh, and some interview work talking to ranchers about how they use weather in their decision making. And they found that 70% of ranchers and forest service managers feel that seasonal forecasts are accurate less than 60% of the time. And it turns out they're right, as we can tell from the previous slide, and that 80% of them want accuracy greater than 70% before they will rely on forecasts. And I feel like that's a pretty reasonable thing to want. So it explains, for me at least, why you know, just about 10% of ranchers are actually using these seasonal forecasts in making decisions on ranch. But I want to present maybe a tool that's a little bit less familiar uh, for folks which is this idea of likelihood predictions based on historical weather data, and specifically something that Andy alluded to, which is the standardized precipitation index. And it's a little complicated, but bear with me. The basic idea is if you take you know, the historical precipitation record, you know, with all of this variation, and you, you translate it into this distribution curve, this bell curve, and you fit 68% uh, of the years in uh, you, you bunch it along average, and so and along this standardized x-axis here, so you have zero being average, plus one, plus two, etc., is more wet than, than average, and minus one, minus two is less wet than average. And so if you are SPI negative one or below, you, that happens 16% of the time, that the 16% of the years are below that negative one SPI. So basically what you do is you take a really noisy, precipitation data set, and you standardize it into numbers that can be compared against themselves. And the Arizona Extension team has created this relatively user-friendly portal 
to accomplish this, and this is an important link for people who are interested in using this tool. But basically what you're able to do is navigate to anywhere, I think, in the U.S. We happen to be at SF Rec right now. You choose the 1895 to 2019 data set, precipitation data set, and you load the data, and you're able to do these tabs up here have some kind of neat, maybe not useful visualizations of the data, but what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk is this drought category transition. And this is what the page looks like. And uh, this is the zoomed out page, I'm going to focus in a second, but I just want to show you over here on the left. What you do is you're working with two time periods, and you're able to conceptually toggle what those time periods are based on what's useful information for you to derive. And it has, and what you toggle here thus changes the information over here on the right. And so what I've done is, again, we're at SF Rec. And I've toggled my two time, peri time periods to be as they are here. And so conceptually what's happening is that time period one is the time period that's already happened. So that's, that, that is behind us. And so right now we're standing at December 1st of the year that we're, the, the conceptual year that we're in. And I'm asking what is the likelihood based on all of the years in the past that have looked like the year that we have now on December 1st. What is the likelihood that we are going to have a normal or below normal or above normal precipitation year? And a very specifically, so, you know, we, precipitation roughly starts in October. Meaningful precipitation, in my opinion, is what goes through March. Maybe April and May we'll get a little bit of forage production. But that's sort of the scenario that I've outlined here. And what the table up here is saying is that if you're standing on December 1st, and it is very dry, and this is what very dry means in terms of actual precipitation. These are the percentages based on the historical past of what the remainder of the year will end up being. So for me as a rancher, I'm interested, if it's very dry, what are the chances that it's going to stay dry and what are the chances it's going to be wet? And what it says here is that if it's very dry, meaning that in the two months of October and November, you've received 2.31 inches of precipitation or less, do you have almost an 80% chance that the year is going to remain dry or very dry? And oppositely, if it's really wet after the two months of you know, late fall, early winter, you know, over 9.5 inches of rain, you have a 90% chance that that year is going to be wet or very wet based on years as they've unfolded historically. For me as a rancher, that's a lot of, I mean, December 1, and I was talking to Larry Ferrero about this and, and another livestock advisor up in Shasta County about sort of how this fits on top of a production schedule, but December 1 is pretty early, at least for me in my opinion, in the winter. And yet you're, giving, you're being given a lot of information about potentially what the precipitation year is going to be like that winter. December 1, Larry noted, you know, if you're a stalker operator, you probably made a lot of decisions about how you're stalking your ranch. But if you're a cow-calf operator, you have there, I think December 1 gives you a lot of opportunity and flexibility to make, some, to make some choices and changes. This is what the figures look like a month later. So now you're standing on January 1 and you're asking what is the full precipitation year going to be like? Or, you know, in years past, when precipitation has been like what it's been like, what it is like now, what is the full year going to be like? And the probabilities increase even more. So if you're very dry, you, know, you, have an eight, you have a one in two chance of remaining very dry. If you're very wet, again, a one in two chance essentially of staying very wet. So again, what does this sort of actually mean for on-ranch decision making? And I think that this exercise, and again, toggling those switches as a producer, which in my mind is fairly simple and, and can be um, accomplished fairly easily, sort of helps you think through a couple of questions. One of which is, what are the critical months for actually receiving precipitation? Um, you know, as I noted earlier, I only had my period two go up, go up to April 1st. In my area of the state, down to Ventura and Santa Barbara County, I mean, our peak standing crop is April 1st this year. So precipitation that we get in April and May doesn't mean all that much for me on my ranch in terms of forage production. But every rancher in every location in the state is able to make that decision for him or herself. And relatedly, what are your critical forage production months? Again, 
You know, maybe you get that miracle march like we did in 91, but if there's forage in April and May, you should have already implemented your drought management plan way back here in January or February. And relatedly, so then what are your critical drought decision dates? And I think toggling that tool and being able to see, well, gosh, on December 1, I have some pretty good information about what the rest of the year is going to be like. That helps me know that I can start making some decisions about drought or about really good forage production years really early on in December. And then relatedly, when you understand what the data can tell you when, how does that overlap with your production calendar and the, and the choices that you need to make on your ranch? So for, exa for example, if you're standing in December 1 and you're standing in very dry conditions, you start selling old cows as early as December because you have a pretty darn good uh, idea that it's going to be very dry or dry. And you start to wean and sell some of those early, the wean early some of those bigger calves. And then oppositely, if you're standing in a very wet winter, you know, can you think about maybe adding some stalkers to your operation to take advantage of the forage that is likely coming? So, in preparing this presentation, and I know there's a lot of numbers and letters here, but I, I tried to go through, there's a, the Simis station here, the weather station has been here since 89, provides monthly uh, precipitation data, and I tried to go through and use this tool with the actual data that came from the Simis station. And we see, the examples that I pulled are, are years that were very, so you see very dry or very wet. And I was really surprised to see how effective this decision-making tool could potentially be. And so in each of these exa examples, I'm standing at the end of no November, for example, in November 2002. And at the time, that table would have been noting that it's very dry, and we've got two-thirds of an inch of rain in those two months. And it would have been telling me to destock, to sell calves, to sell calves. And sure enough, I mean, the full season's precipitation was in the dry category. And you can see how that works out for 91, 92, 95, 96, 97, 98 in an opposite way. Although Jeremy did note that forage production wasn't very good that year, so maybe that's not a good example. Um, but 08, 09, and then these are other years where there were strong signals, and what I mean by that is that the November, or, yeah, the October, November rainfall was maybe not in the very dry category, but was pretty close. So again, these are sort of categorical variables. It's either dry or very dry, when really, of course, precipitation is along the gradient. But again, you know, these are strong signals where there was very, where there was pretty dry falls, and these are all years that ended up having really dry years. So this decision support tool really, I think, I was surprised at how well it, it, it could effectively assist the rancher in making a decision on ranch. With the time I have remaining, I just want to sort of address this theme of a drying climate using this SPI tool. Um, I'm sort of adapting a paper that the Arizona team came out with, and this is data from the Santa Rita Experimental Range, which is similar to this experiment station, uh, but in Arizona. And they had a 73-year uh, record of rainfall on the station. And what uh, Mitch McLaren and his uh, co-author did was they thought that they recognized a place in the uh, historical data set where there was a real break for them. I think this is running uh, from the early 40s to the present. For them, that break was 1996. And they looked at the SPI. So again, um, I don't know if I explained it yet. So this would be sort of on the y-axis, you have SPI essentially, where zero is average. Uh, negative one, everything below negative one would be in that very dry category. And so they're showing that in 1996 and beyond, there was a real increase in the number of years that were, that were below this negative one threshold, meaning that an increase in the number of years that were very dry. And so I've taken the data from their tool, from SFREC, and sort of done a similar analysis. And instead of choosing 1996 as the cutoff year, I thought I recognized a change starting with the 1976 drought. And so again, here what's happening, and I just want to emphasize, this is actually not just SPI, this precipitation index, this is actually an index which is including evapotranspiration, so it also it incorporates temperature into it as well. 
Again, zero would be average, and so the green bars are above average, and the brown bars are below average. Here's that red line, which is negative one threshold, because everything below that is very dry. And what I'm seeing is that in this 80-year period, um, about one in six years were very dry. In the period since the 76 drought, it's changed a little bit. It's one in five years. It's maybe a slight drying, maybe just an artifact of chance. This, however, is one of the neat things about the SPI and SPEI tools on that website is that you can determine your own time periods. And so rather than focusing on the full water year, what I've done here is break the water year into different two-month intervals. And so you can see in November, December, that there really hasn't been a drying trend in those two periods. And in fact, since 76, uh, falls have maybe even been slightly wetter. You can see in this March-April period here that between the two periods, it's almost no change whatsoever. But the thing that was really interesting for me is that there's this pretty dramatic change in the January-February uh, precipitation patterns between those two periods. So that prior to 75, about one in eight years were dry, were very dry in this January-February period, and then suddenly one in four years since the 76th drought. I think the thing I'd like to invite everyone to think about, and was what I was trying to get at in terms of how this might be useful for a rancher, is that it, it forces you, uh, you know, if you're in production, to think about how this is going to impact your forage year. You know, I think people who are on the ground and running cattle and have a very intimate sense of when forage comes on and when they need forage can potentially think about what happens if suddenly January, February has a whole lot less rain. I know in my neck of the woods where the, where the uh, production season is truncated, where we re really rely on this January, February precipitation to grow most of our grass in March, this is a really big deal. Maybe up here where the forage season is a little bit extended, uh, there's more of a buffering. <clears throat> so again, I just sort of want to summarize. We talked about NOAA and how... I, don't, I hope there aren't any meteorologists in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very effective tool to rely on. And I hope I've made the case that this, that this website here with the URL back earlier in the presentation, but this idea of using historical data to inform future decision-making can be a pretty compelling thing to use on ranch. Uh, these are some of the resources, and I don't know how long I've gone, but maybe there's a time or two for questions. Thank you. Time for a couple questions, Yes. Um, not just this presentation, but the previous two. When you use the term forage and grassland, what are you referring to? I don't entirely understand the question, but I mean, in my context, you know, forage is the you know the biomass that ranchers and producers rely on for well, seeding livestock. Between perennial grasses and annual grasses, are you talking about perennial grasslands or annual? I mean, I'm talking about what we have here in California, which is predominantly annual grasslands. I mean, the perennial component of our grasslands across the state is minuscule to the point of maybe not being significant in my personal opinion and I understand that there are people working across the state who are interested in increasing the amount of perennial grasses as a drought mitigation strategy but for the vast majority of producer, production ranchers who need to rely on the forage that we have it's going to be annual so that's kind of what I'm talking about. Anything else for Joe? Yes. Um, you know all this predictions by and dandy, but as a rancher, I have certain issues with ranching in California that makes it very difficult to uh, implement uh, drought management strategies in, in the, in the range and uh, uh, in, in improvements. And uh, uh, some of that uh, has to do with You know, you have conflicting environmental goals, the uh, uh, 
low interest rates, high value of land, it makes it very difficult to uh, put inputs into land and to make those management strategies. I fully recognize that, and I'm by no means trying to suggest that this is the cure-all for understanding how to manage drought. I was simply presenting it as one tool that folks can use to inform their decision making relatively early on in a, a year that might be drought like. You know, you're going to need to implement a whole set of tools from your toolbox. And this is just neat because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's using data that we've had historically but sort of packaged in a way that, you know, is relatively easily accessible. So that's the only thing I wanted to emphasize in this presentation. And for sure, I mean, the, the, the amount of planning and, and the complexity as a rancher in California dealing with drought is immense. Um, although ranchers seem to be, I mean, if you're still ranching in California, you're pretty good at managing um, drought and complexity. And so, you know, that's another thing to recognize. Can you put the website back up? Sure. And I think these will all be made available um, through, through the presentation, or through the workshop today. Yeah, really good point. I think we'll, we'll post these presentations, but I think we, we'll go ahead and there's been a couple links out there. We'll go ahead and just share that with everybody that registered um, so you guys don't have to write it down. It'll be good. Scott. Um, did you happen to, I think you kind of alluded to, but for the, um, those pieces that you did look here at SF right and making those predictions, um, did you look at those forage production data in those years compared to those years that were those very those very wet for making those predictions in January, February, February, March? That's absolutely the next step, and I haven't done that yet. And I was talking with uh, Dustin and Nikolai earlier. I mean, unfortunately, you know, that 76 cutoff that I'm seeing um, corresponds exactly with when SFREX started taking forage production data. And so, I mean, I'm sure, I know there's longer, maybe I don't know, I think there might be longer data sets available, maybe at San Joaquin. But again, it's not going to have that monthly component to it. And so, how well we're going to be able to layer on the forage production stuff is an outstanding question. But, you know, <coughs> maybe the most important one. Yes? It seemed like in those very dry or very wet years, there's you know you're seeing a strong correlation with like the remainder of the the rainfall year staying that way. I'm curious about like the more average years. Is that a good predictor of like things remaining average or? Yeah, that's a good question. I you know I focused on the of the very dry and the very wet in part because the harder I looked at this table, the more sort of muddled the percentages looked and the more sort of 50-50 it all was. And, you know, when you're a rancher, I don't think you're going to be willing to make an important stocking decision, for example, if the, if, you know, if the likelihood is 50-50. And it's when you get further out on the extremes that the percentages start getting more compelling. So you're getting like 90% wet or 80% dry sort of a thing. And that's, you know, all of this is a personal... As a producer, it's a personal um, decision about how you know comfortable you feel with with taking risk. You know, you know. Again, Larry Ferrero's point in my conversation with him is even if you know this is telling me it's going to be 90% wet, I'm sure as heck not going to be buying extra stockers based on a like historical likelihood. But some people might feel comfortable to do so. Um, just to sort of food for thought. I really like the way you're aiming this towards prediction and towards uh, asset allocation. If you were to add a component of soil temperature, would it increase your accuracy? Is that data available? For sentence it is. Yeah, I don't know. This, I mean, a lot of this stuff I'm relying just on the under the hood stuff on that Arizona extension right. uh, website, but I, I imagine that sort of stuff can be built in. Observationally, that surface seems to have an impact as well as in terms of timing the forage production and spread flush and all the other things. Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing this to our attention. That's really uh, standardized uh, SPI index data that everyone comes to. That's really cool to take a whole historical range and actually make, give me something from it. I thought so too. That's really cool. Yeah. <coughs> All right, well, thank you, Matthew. Thank awesome. you, guys. Okay.